that we are the very first species on planet Earth aware of our own evolution. We've heard about the billions of years of evolution. We are the first species to know we are affecting our own evolution by everything we do. And we can see that we are affecting our evolution in such a manner that we might devolve. We might destroy our life support system. We might actually render ourselves extinct. Today we have two evolutionary love codes. Your clarified heart's desire is the evolutionary impulse awake and alive in you, as you and through you. Your clarified heart's desire is the tuning fork of your unique self. Your unique self is the invitation and the demand of the self-organizing universe that you choose joy, join genius, and play your instrument in the unique self symphony. And now for the second code. Are you ready to be evolution? Are you ready to participate in the evolution of consciousness and culture? Are you ready to participate in the evolution of love? Are you ready to love deeper and wider than you ever have before? Are you ready to include something or someone in your circle of love that has always been on the outside? Are you ready to change, grow, and transform in the way that you have long given up on? Are you ready to be a dreamer? Are you ready to activate evolutionary love in you, as you, and through you? Are you ready to be and become more than you ever thought possible? Are you ready to awaken as conscious evolution? I just wanna say a couple of things as we get started. This is a big day and we're, we're celebrating Barbara Marks Hubbard, you know, who was and is, you know, my and our evolutionary partner. And we're gonna be focusing today on the evolution of conscious evolution. I just wanna say something about Barbara Marks Hubbard, right? I am madly in love with Barbara Marks Hubbard, right? And she is just an awesome being. She's no longer with us in this world. Right, she's moved on to that next structure and phase of existence, which is Mr. to us. But we know through much validated information of the continuity of consciousness. And Barbara and I together, as evolutionary partners, founded this, this one mountain, many paths. We originally called it Evolutionary Church. And you're gonna hear from Barbara today. And Barbara said to me dozens of times, she said, Wow, right this evolutionary undertaking, this one mountain, many paths, this evolutionary church, this has got to be the heart of the revolution. This is the place where we can actually tell the new story. And Barbara and I wrestled together and she came to, to find me in 2013 or 14. Someone introduced us and we did a deep set of dialogues together, which are online. And then she joined us at our Success 3.0 event. And then she read unique self material and, 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 and lots of other things and said, you know, she was at that time 84. She said, I don't know how much time I have left, but I understand that you and, and the people around you are holding the next evolution of conscious evolution. And you're holding some pieces I was missing. And I want to bring to you the pieces I have. And let's join genius and co-create. Let's not join genes, as Barbara loved to say. Let's join genius and co-create. And she stepped in with full power, with full energy. And, and tornadoes right, were caused in many ways right, by the coming together of, of these energies. And an enormous goodness was created. An enormous creativity was unleashed. And Barbara and I spoke. And you know, tears in my eyes, right? We spoke, communicated, didn't always speak, communicated four or five times a day, literally, right, for those last several years. And Barbara was quite literally until the last several days when she was unconscious, Barbara was in full, powerful, cognizant form, right? She went through very hard times in the last five years. She was often profoundly pained and lonely because many of her best friends, right, had passed away and she felt 
and in deep senses alienated from different dimensions of her world. And in other ways, she was more alive and more on fire than ever. And Barbara would literally every day, she would face the emptiness and she'd work through it and she'd walk through it and she'd call me and we'd talk or we would exchange a text or, or a voice message. And every single day, she literally recreated herself and lived this knowing that we don't get older, we get newer. And she had more energy pouring through her and more delight and more audacity and more impishness, right? And more creativity and, and more sense of let's renew it every day. And she, she would call me every day or I would call her and she would share with me a set of ideas that we, would, we had talked about and that we both understood, but she would share them not because she forgot, it wasn't amnesia, but she would share them completely anew as if we'd never talked about them before with full power and excitement, right? Like a version, right? For the very first time. That's how we approach ideas. That's how we approach first principles and first values. We actually re-engage with full passion every day. And Barbara, I miss you enormously. I miss kind of your radical positivity and your willingness to move through the emptiness and to move through the pain and your willingness to, to grow, right? Barbara was evolution personified. She evolved. And literally we did Holy of Holies, right? I mean, private study together every single week, right? And she would always say, okay, how can I grow? How can I be more? She would never say, okay, I, I know the first principles. I know the Dharma. No, no. How can I learn this again? How can I read more? How can I embody more? Barbara was and is in her next incarnation, but right now was, was a great, great, great being. And, and I love her dearly and loved her dearly. And I have mad depth and, and admiration and, and honor for all of her work. And part of her capacity to grow was to understand we've got to go in this, a next stage. And so Barbara and I disagreed radically with how she was presenting conscious evolution for the first you know, 30, 40 years of her life. And Barbara didn't originate the idea of conscious evolution, but she became its primary champion. And as we began to talk, and I challenged certain ways in which Barbara understood conscious evolution, she, she began to assimilate and integrate those. And in the video you're about to see, Barbara and I had already been talking for two years. So some of the core ideas we have talked, we had talked about are integrated there, others aren't. But I want you to really hear Barbara. And then I'll share with you what Barbara and I together, joining genius synergized and how we, how we brought this together, right? In the last five years of her life. And perhaps I can say one other thing there's, and I apologize, you know, slightly and sincerely for being direct. There's, there's a few people in the world who want to kind of reframe Barbara as what she did her whole life until the last five years. But actually that's not what Barbara wanted. Barbara was viewed the last five years of her life as being wildly creative right? Wildly alive, right? Wildly transformative and deepening because that was her, her integrity and her audacity. And I've, I've made a commitment to Barbara to, to share these, these ideas, these shared ideas with the world. And, and I also want to just make one last invitation as we turn to Barbara, which is we're actually looking to hire a person full-time to work particularly with Barbara's legacy and integrating it into this new story of value. And I have you know, she, she left with the center, right, an, an entire sheath of unpublished documents that need to be integrated into the story, and they need to be kind of curated and, and, and unpacked and downloaded. And of course, we don't have the resource to do all of that ourselves, so I'm actually looking to hire a person really to, to take this on in a big way. Krista, Joseph, together with Ken Kinghorn, have done a brilliant job of actually recreating Barbara's website, Conscious Evolution. We're going to be launching that in the next probably six, seven weeks. Peter Fikowski has stepped on as the, the new board chair, right? The co-board chair is Christina Kincaid of the Foundation for Conscious Evolution. So we're going to give that site an entirely new emergence. And we're going to be talking there about the kind of 1.0 version of Conscious Evolution and six other major ideas. And the 2.0 version of those ideas that Barbara and I worked with together in the last five years. So we, we put a ton of work into that and we're really looking for someone to step up and say, yay, I wanna fund this downloading of Barbara, the integration of Barbara's legacy into this work. So if anyone would like to do that and just specifically for that in honor of Barbara to kind of integrate Barbara's legacy, so find me directly, 
right, through Krista, right, and be delighted to talk to him. We want to unpack that the next level. So without further ado, huge drum roll, right, the, the great, great spokesperson, I think the greatest spokesperson and the greatest storyteller of conscious evolution in the second half of the 20th century, right, I bring you my, my beloved evolutionary partner, Barb Marks Hubbard. What is conscious evolution? Conscious evolution is evolution by choice, not chance. For billions of years, evolution has been progressing. We've had five mass extinctions. We've had billions of species extinct before we got here. But the interesting thing is that we are the very first species on planet Earth aware of our own evolution. We've heard about the billions of years of evolution. We are the first species to know we are affecting our own evolution by everything we do. The babies we have, the food we eat, the cars we drive, the wars we fight, even the thoughts we hold about each other. And we can see that we are affecting our evolution in such a manner that we might devolve. We might destroy our life support system. We might actually render ourselves extinct. What this amounts to is the greatest wake up call that humanity has ever had because no species has been responsible for its own devolution or evolution. We have no experience in this, but nonetheless, we're entering the first age of conscious evolution. And I believe in retrospect, when we look back on this age, it will be as great a breakthrough as was self-reflective consciousness in the Neanderthal world. What is the social potential movement? We know what the human potential movement was. It was when Abraham Maslow, the psychologist, began to study human wellness rather than illness. And he identified a new kind of person. It was in the 1960s and he called it a self-actualizing human. And that is somebody with self-rewarding work that they find intrinsically valuable and of service. And when he mapped the characteristics of the self-actualizing person, we began to try to be self-actualizing. And it started the human potential movement, the transpersonal movement, the whole consciousness movement was really started by that thought. The social potential movement is the next step. As he identified peaks of human wellness and got the self-actualizing person, it's time to identify the peaks of social excellence, social innovation, social wellness. And if we could trace the peaks in health, in education, in economics, in science and technology, in energy, in government that are working at the highest level, we would have the beginning of the self-actualizing society. And my book, Conscious Evolution, Awakening the Power of Our Social Potential, is an early contribution to the self-actualizing society. And if that takes hold like the self-actualizing person does, we will begin to see more of us working to actualize our social potential. What do you mean problems are evolutionary drivers? It's very obvious. We find it in our own personal lives and we find it in the life of the larger social system. Problems are evolutionary drivers because you either solve them by doing better and changing something or they do you in. Another phrase is crises precede transformation. And in evolution, when you look at the billions of years of transformation, almost every time there is a quantum jump of a higher order from single cell to multi cell to animal to human, you will find a series of crises to the life form just before the jump. And the way nature takes jumps through crises and problems is this mysterious function of being able to connect separate parts to make a new whole greater than the sum of its parts. And you can see right now, our culture is under stress. We have a crisis to our entire environment. 
We have a crisis with global warming. We have the possibility of running out of fresh water. We are in danger. What is that doing? It's making us realize that we have to change our economic system, our political system, and our war machine. It means we're going to have to learn to cooperate. So if you jump over the crisis and imagine us being able to respond co-creatively, I think we're going to see a much better future and a much better humanity. Or devolution and extinction, that's the driver. You speak of evolution as guided by spirit and action with a tendency towards higher consciousness, freedom and order. There is a very deep controversy in the way people look at the meaning of evolution. The materialistic, scientific, modernistic view of evolution is that it is a random process guided by accident and physical laws. And as you get up to life, it is through error and random mutation and the process of natural selection and reproductive advances that lead to this entire universe. The other view is that the consciousness is primary and out of consciousness has come the emergence of energy, matter, life, and consciousness force. The genius of evolution is consciousness in action that has led not as a god outside manipulating things, but as a process of trial and error and meandering and mistakes and many, many extinctions. But nonetheless, you can't look at the spiral of evolution without seeing it's going somewhere. And when we hit a crisis, we seem to move to higher order, more complexity, more freedom, more consciousness, more synergy, more complexity, more love. And the exciting part for us is that we are expressions of that intelligent universe, hopefully being awakened from within by that creative intelligence to become more intelligent, more consciousness, more creative, more loving, and to take it the next step more synergistic, which would mean that instead of everything being in a separate silo, like uh, healthcare or religion or science and technology, what we have is synergy, the coming together of separate parts in our society to make a greater whole system that was far greater than the sum of our parts. So it's very important how we interpret evolution. And as a co-creator, you feel the evolutionary impulse in you to be more creative. When you feel that, you don't feel it's just your personal whim. You feel you're in, you're participating with a greater force for a greater purpose. And you feel that your inner drive to express yourself is part of the noble purpose of the universe itself. What can an individual do about all this? How do I participate personally in conscious evolution? How do I participate personally in conscious evolution? That is a very good question. Some people say to me, Barbara, you think you are going to influence evolution? Like I was crazy. And I say, yes, everybody is influencing evolution. And if you think of us at a tipping point when we could go to devolution and destruction or evolution and higher levels of creativity, what you realize that every single person is influencing the tipping point. If you're very depressed and you're going down, you're helping the tip that way. If you're activated and realizing your own motivation, your own life purpose, your own inner drive, if you're saying yes to creative action, vocation, vocation of destiny, life purpose, that is what the individual can do. Identify what attracts you what you most deeply want to express and to become and to give and say the big yes to that. Then you have to reach out. You have to find others that are attracted to you, that you are attracted to them, and you have to begin to co-create. And at the highest level of co-creation, you discover vocational arousal. You are excited if somebody needs what you most deeply want to do or give and so that you can join genius with others.
as we join genes to have the baby, now we're having fewer children and living longer and longer lives, we can join our genius. And when you do with two or more, you find you're more than you ever were before. And you've given more to the universe. Uh, I mentioned Abraham Maslow's study of self-actualizing people, all of whom had one trait in common, self-rewarding action or vocation. They found intrinsically self-rewarding and of service. So in order to participate in evolution, it's to find not just a job or a project, but an expression of your own creativity such that when you offer it into the world, it's of service to others and you feel rewarded in the creativity of it. And we used to think that was only artists or writers or the very, very special geniuses, but actually everybody has a unique self. Everybody has a unique gift to give. And whether it's a mother, a farmer, a gardener, a futurist, a scientist, the key is it's self-rewarding, it's of service, you are rewarded in the doing of it, and that is your greatest contribution to conscious evolution. Okay, so thank you, Barbara, right? And that was just completely beautiful. And now let's go the next step. And I'm, I mean, whenever I see Barbara and I see her often, and I, I miss you deeply, Barbara. And now let me share with people what we did. This conversation that you just heard from Barbara was recorded around 2015. You notice she was already talking about unique self, you know, and unique gift. She had just actually read the Unique Self book. We started talking in 2013. So this was a couple of years later, but before we'd gone into the depths, now stay close for friends. Okay, we just got, we've got a few minutes. I'm gonna try and take this wild ride. So Barbara at this point in the conversation was in mid emergence of this next stage of conscious evolution, which is the core of what we're doing here at the center, the new story of value of cosmorotic humanism. And just note, okay, and stay really close friends, okay? So Barbara starts the conversation by saying, conscious evolution is evolution not by choice, right? Excuse me, conscious evolution, let's run that sentence again. Conscious evolution is evolution by choice, not chance. So that is precisely incorrect. And that's what Barbara and I worked with and Barbara actually transcended that sentence. And that was the standard sentence that she used for 30 years. And in that she was similar to people like, let's say Brian Swim, who worked with Thomas Berry and did enormously and is still doing enormously good work in the universe story. But at the same time, Brian and Brian and I have communicated. We've never quite been able to sit and talk, but we're aware of each other's work. And Brian's done fantastic work with Mary, Mary Evelyn Tucker, but particularly Brian's work as a mathematical cosmologist. What Brian does is he adopts time and again the standard neo-Darwinian narrative of evolution by chance, random mutation, natural selection. That neo-Darwinian synthesis is actually dead in science. It's an old neo-Darwinian synthesis, which at the major time that Brian was writing, you couldn't actually break with, but needs to be broken with, not to any form of intelligent design, a superimposed intelligent design, but to a much deeper understanding of the universe story. So Brian did the same thing that Barbara was doing here, where Barbara says, conscious evolution is evolution by choice, not by chance. That's precisely where, where we actually evolved. Right? That is to say, evolution doesn't first become conscious through human beings. Evolution did not manifest mitosis and meiosis. Evolution did not manifest the chlorophyll molecule. Try and work out what the chlorophyll molecule is. It's actually shocking, right? Through a random process, which was pure accident without any sense of intrinsic meaning. Rather, a deeper understanding of the science is that actually there is value and meaning all the way down and all the way up the evolutionary chain. Now, does that mean that atoms experience meaning like human beings do? No, it doesn't. And myself and 
my colleague Zachary Stein have articulated a very deep understanding of the radical continuity of value all through matter, life, and mind, and the discontinuity, how at every level of matter, there's a new emergence of value and you jump from matter to life from the physiosphere to the biosphere, right? there's an even deeper emergence, right? a jump to a deeper understanding of value. And we emerge from the biosphere of life to the depth of the self-reflective human, then meaning and value evolve. So there's both continuity of value and meaning all the way from matter to life to mind. And there's discontinuity. But there is value in consciousness and meaning all the way up and all the way down the evolutionary chain. A, that's clear, meaning evolution before the human being wasn't evolution by chance. There actually is an inherent consciousness to evolution. There's a love intelligence without which it is actually impossible to make sense of cosmos. We're not talking about a cosmic vending machine, caricatured creator God, right, who wants to make sure that you're having proper sex, which is appropriately heterosexual and doesn't have any sense of that, which is beyond classical gender, right? And says that, you know, not that. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about an inherent love intelligence of cosmos that clearly has direction. There's telos. There are inherent first principles and first values which are the plot lines of the universe story. Never got that. That's insanely exciting. And Barbara actually brought myself and my dear friend through Barbara, Howard Bloom, who kind of understands himself as, as being kind of alienated completely from the world of spirit, kind of a hardcore scientist in some sense, one of the, the kind of hidden scientific gurus of the space program, widely published. And in our first conversation, you know, Barbara asked me to share this new set of ideas with Howard that had so animated her, where we actually began to understand that conscious evolution doesn't mean that evolution becomes conscious. There is some dimension of the evolutionary process that's always been conscious, number one. Conscious evolution means that we as human beings become awake, aware, and alive and realize that evolution is moving through us, that we are irreducibly unique expressions of the evolutionary process, that actually the evolutionary impulse moves uniquely in me and my awareness of that, number one, my awareness that I am evolution, right, is a new emergent. There are, there are as I pointed out in beautiful conversation with Barbara for many hours, there are antecedents to that idea that live in the interior sciences. That idea is actually present, but that idea is validated through evolutionary science. We actually realize that actually every muon and every hadron and every lepton and every proton, neutron and electron, every atom and every molecule and every macromolecule, right, in all of the stages of organismic evolution, right, they all live in me. Right? All of the physiosphere, all of matter, all of the biosphere, all of life actually lives in me and all previous stages, structure stages of humanity live in me. And so I don't live in evolution. Evolution lives in me. That's a, a momentous leap, that awareness. So the conscious evolution, the, the notion of conscious evolution is I awaken as the realization that I am a conscious evolution person. That's number one. And, and number two, and this is going to be the topic of our next call. Number two, I, I actually realize that conscious evolution, that evolution is, is animated by Eros. And this, and you might have noticed in Barbara's talk, in the second part of the talk, she said, the most important question is, which she was unresolved, you know, pretty much until 2015, the most important question is, how do we understand the evolutionary story? Is the evolutionary story a story of evolution by chance? which is how she began the conversation and affirmed that, which is incorrect. But in the second part, she was already considering the deeper conversations we were having about evolution being a coherent process animated by intelligence. And she understood very deeply that, that everything rests on resolving that question. And we can't resolve that question by declaration. We can't resolve it by faith. 
We have to resolve it by actually telling a new story of value where we go so deep into the evolutionary sciences that we actually read the science so deeply that science begins to tell the story of the eros of evolution. Now, we actually understand that evolution is animated by eros. It's animated by evolutionary love. And that I, as a human being, am evolutionary love in person. And that evolution is the progressive deepening of intimacies. And that intimacy means something. And I'm going I'm to hold here. But all of this is what we spent the last five years on. And I, I can tell you, Barbara was ecstatically excited about it, contributed an enormous amount to it, and it reconfigured her own understanding of conscious evolution. So the, the conclusion would be, conscious evolution is A, not that evolution becomes conscious. Evolution was always conscious, one. Two, conscious evolution is, I become aware that evolution is conscious in me. I become aware that I am evolution, two. Three, I become aware of the entire story of evolution. Four, I can locate myself as, I can locate my story as chapter and verse in the evolutionary story. Five, I understand that evolution is animated by Eros, and therefore my story is a love story. Six, I understand that my love story is chapter and verse in the love story of evolution. That evolution is the love story of the universe. And I'm wildly excited to share that Barbara and I together with Zach Stein will be sharing a group of five volumes that actually tell that story that we've been working on for the last four years. That's wildly exciting. And Barbara, that's that's such deep honor to you and such a deep love for you and such, such deep delight.